Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the East Bay Regional Park District operations meeting. And it is May the 10th and it is 1233. Um, let's go ahead and start the meeting with a roll call, please. Okay, yes, Chair Corbett. Uh, Director Wieskamp? Aye. Here. Director Rosario? Here. Chair Corbett? Here. AGM O'Connor? Here. And we also have uh, staff presenters and participants, which include Ruby Tumber, we have Noah Dort, Tiffany Margolisi, Chief Anthony Chiaburro, David Vance, Lieutenant Giorgio Chavez, Nelly Cesaris, Robert Kennedy, Shannon Punt, and Steve Castile. Today's meeting is being held pursuant to the Brown Act as amended by AB 361. Board members and staff may participate via phone or video conferencing. Today's meeting is being conducted virtually with live audio and video stream provided. Public comments may be submitted live via Zoom, via email, or via voicemail as noted on the agenda located on the Park District website. If there are no questions about the meeting procedures, we will begin. Thank you very much to our assistant of the committee, Denise Valentine, thank you so much. Uh, anything else members before we go ahead and call the first item? No. All right. Our first item uh, today is to review the Vasco Caves Caretaker Renewal Agreement at the CAS, excuse me, Vasco Caves Regional Preserves. So let's go start with that one. All righty. Thank you. Thank you, Director Corbett. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen for the presentation. <laughs> All right, can everybody see this okay? Hi. Fantastic, all right. Uh, good afternoon, committee members. My name is Noah Dort, Administrative Analyst in Operations Business Services. And I'm seeking a recommendation from the Board Operations Committee to enter into an agreement with Neil Nobriga to perform caretaker services at Vasco Caves Regional Preserve. The Vasco Caves Regional Preserve was jointly acquired by the East Bay Regional Park District and Contra Costa Water District in 1989, and has been operated by the Park District in agreement with the Water District. To protect the, excuse me, to protect the preserve's unique resources, the preserve is not open to unscheduled general public visits, and the exact location of the caves is not published by the Park District. Public access to Vasco Caves is only available through advanced reservation on tour guided by Park District staff. The preserve is home excuse me, is home to threatened species such as red-legged frogs, tiger salamanders, and fairy shrimp, which live in vernal pools. Mm. The preserve is also habitat for eagles and a variety of nesting raptors. The archeological sites of Vasco Caves contain indigenous American rock art as part of a cultural complex that reaches back thousands of years. Vasco Caves presents some unique caretaking challenges, both long-term and short-term. It is increasingly difficult to maintain the secrecy of the cave's location as technology advances and is more easily accessible to the public. Satellite photos, GPS and phones, or other low-cost standalone devices, and the geocaching hobby have made it easier for anyone to find, record, and disseminate location details to the public. Although Park District staff works to mitigate this issue wherever possible, it could potentially contribute to unauthorized public access. Due to the isolated nature of the area, there are limited options for utilities at the caretaker residence and nearby public bathrooms. Park District staff built a small solar power system to provide electricity to the caretaker residence, and water for public bathroom use and cleaning <coughs> for use the caretaker residence is delivered by truck. The caretaker residence is located on an exposed hilltop and is subject to the hot and cold extremes of the East Bay environment as well as the strong winds that make the area appealing for the surrounding windmill farm. The old trailer style caretaker residence was replaced with a new stick built house that was completed this year through a multiple residence replacement project headed by Jeff Rasmussen. In addition to providing more living space for the caretaker, the new residence is more efficient for temperature control, will better withstand the elements, and the slab foundation will improve pest intrusion prevention. <clears throat> Caretaker duties include providing a security presence on weekends and most weekdays, routine foot and vehicle patrols of the area, including the wind turbines still on the property, 
monitoring visitor compliance with Ordinance 38 and Park District rules and regulations, including occasional assistance with scheduled district-led public tours, providing daily written narrative and attendance reports, monitoring the nearby chemical toilets for sufficient supplies, and maintaining confidentiality regarding Vasco Cave's details. Mr. Nobrigo first entered into an agreement to perform caretaker services at Vasco Caves in 2012, and after open application and interview processes, he was again selected in 2016 and 2019 to be the caretaker at Vasco Caves. He has received positive annual reviews of his caretaker services from district staff prior to each extension of the contract term. The current caretaker contract with Mr. Nobrega will end on July 11th, 2022. Mr. Nobrega has received positive evaluation of his caretaker services from Park Supervisor Chris Lyle and Unit Manager Terry Noonan. Staff recommends entering into an agreement, <clears throat> excuse me, into an agreement for caretaker services for Vasco Caves Regional Preserve with Mr. Neil Nobrega. The initial term of the agreement would be two years, commencing July 12th, 2022. With a possibility, <clears throat> excuse me, with the possibility of one three-year extension upon mutual agreement between the Park District and Mr. Nubriga for a maximum total of five years ending July 11th, 2027. The cost of the Park District for this action is $42,222.24 for the first year to increase by 1.5% annually during the term of this agreement. The initial annual contract costs compute to $3,518.52 per month for providing caretaker services at Vasco Caves Regional Preserve. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Dort. Board members, do you have any questions for him? Yes, Director Rosario. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> good presentation. Uh, Regarding the solar, is the solar attached to the house or did you say it was um, a separate uh, facility? It's a, it's a separate, <coughs> unit, not attached to the, to the um, or the one, it's a uh, mounted on the ground and there's a um, utility shed uh, nearby that houses uh, some of the equipment, including the batteries. Oh, good. And then glad to hear that. And then um, regarding the water, uh, <laughs> is the water trucked from, um, the nearby service yard, or is it? I believe it's a commercial, um, commercially trucked in. Uh, so I don't believe it's directly from the service yard. Um, and I believe that they come by every few months. I want to say every three months. I don't know how frequent uh, it's been. It's been since it's really hasn't had much public access recently. We don't have uh, too much, uh, I believe because of COVID, we don't have too much recent information, but I believe it was every three months or so before that. Okay. Mr. O'Connor, I saw your hand up. Uh, uh, Director Rosario, just to add into Noah's answer, um, the the service yard uh, water system, the well is is really not a uh, um, it's not drinkable. <laughs> so yeah, so we don't get it from the service yard because that's not a good well source. Okay, and then um, which brings my next question is um, perfect segue. Um, is it possible to set up a similar system for the residents rain capture? Uh, off that roof for non-potable uses yeah. around the residents? Uh, potentially, uh, it's just a matter of uh, staff time to do that. So mm -hmm. uh, that could be an option. We'd have to look at that. Okay. And the last question is sanitation. Is that, um, I'm assuming it's not sewer. So is that pumped out? Or is no, it septic? I, I actually, I, I don't know the answer to that, uh, Director Rosario. I, I believe that it is pumped out, but I don't, as opposed to a leach field, but I don't, I don't know for sure. Yeah, I, I believe it's a holding tank. The old uh, residents had a holding tank that was yeah. emptied by sanitation staff. So I believe it's the same because we also have the uh, ball uh, toilet that's uh, yeah. there for the public tours. Okay, great. Sounds like a cushy deal. No. <laughs> 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 it looked pretty cozy. <coughs> There's a lot a, of a, a much better improvement than the, the old trailer. So oh, thank, you. Sure. thank you. Director Wieskamp. I think we're very lucky to have someone like Mr. Nobrega. I mean, when you take on that responsibility, you're taking on being isolated. I assume he likes the area. And from all I've heard from staff, he does a good job of all the parts of his job. But what he was living in there was not good in the past. So I think he deserves this type of uh, 
modern, shall we say, residents. And so I'm pleased that he's willing to stay. And uh, I think we're, again, lucky to have him. So thank you, Mr. Nobrega, for being such a good person, handling a very unusual job. Great. Thank you very much. And um, I want to say thank you to Mr. Nobrega, too. Obviously, he's been doing a wonderful job out there. And we appreciate that. And uh, all of the questions <laughs> have been asked, <laughs> so I don't need to ask any more questions. However, I'm also appreciative that uh, uh, Mr. Dort, you were, you were able to give us uh, the answer to a question I was interested in, and that was when did we start our uh, partnership with the, the Water District um, to have this uh, beautiful site that's, uh, you know, it's just outstanding, both as a historic and environmental preserve spot. And can be very proud of that as part of the East Bay Regional Park District. So um, thank you for letting us know how long it's been going on. Pleasure. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Um, if there aren't any additional questions, is anybody else, uh, anybody else have any staff have anything they want to say about the uh, item? If not, we can go ahead and take a vote. Need a motion first. Uh, well, if anybody else would like to say something, yes, no? Okay, very good. Motion. I move. A second. Thank you very much. There is a motion moved by Director Rosario and seconded by Director Wieskamp. Uh, please call the vote on the vote. Yes, Chair Corbett. Director Rosario? Aye. Director Wieskamp? Aye. Chair Corbett? Aye. So moved. Thank you so much. Thank you, Noah. Thank you. Passes unanimously. Good to see you again, Noah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ann. All right. Okay. And our next uh, item on the agenda today is our item number three review the renewal of the SAFRAN helicopter maintenance agreement. Public safety will be presenting it to us. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, Director Corbett. I'll be sharing my screen with you for this presentation. Give me just a second. Okay, very good. Can you all see my screen? No. Not yet. We can see you. <laughs> okay. There you go. All right. It's coming in. Perfect. And then you want to make there it a little broader. Is. We have those small spots as well. As, there we go. Perfect. Thank All right. You. Can you see it? Perfect. Sorry about that. Thanks for that. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, Board Operations Committee and everyone in attendance. Thank you for having me today. My name is Giorgio Chavez, and I am the Lieutenant of uh, Police and Public Safety, and I'm also the Air Support Unit Commander. Today, I will be presenting on renewing a five year contract with SAFRAN for our Air Support Unit's helicopter maintenance which includes services for both Eagle 7 and Eagle 8. So our agents are inspected and maintained at periodic uh, intervals, um, either 30 hours, 100 hours, 165 hours, and et cetera, it moves on, uh, per manufacturer and FAA requirements. We do this to maintain and prolong engine service life. At the end of engine life, uh, for Eagle 7 is set at 3,500 hours and for Eagle 8 is at 5,000 5, hours, it will need to be overhauled to get a new lease on life. Essentially with Safran, we pay for this overhaul as we go at set rates by hourly usage. So it's in today's dollars instead of at a big inflated cost years from now. So our agreement with Safran is that we fly and maintain the aircraft and engines for standards and procedures with care. Safran monitors and confirms in the end cover costs of the overhaul, as well as normal wear and tear and unexpected malfunctions and failures along the way. So the costs are fixed based on hourly engine use and rate and they're set up front. And uh, what's covered is all the wear and tear from uh, flying, as well as new wear and tear due to uh, fighting fires, which is now more prolific than it has been in the past. So our support by the hour results in maintenance coverage, inflation protection, contingency protection, as well as cost savings, and there's no additional cost. Our expenses are set at today's uninflated dollars, 
um, and it saves us costs over time, over the life of the overhauls and the maintenance altogether. So what we're paying for essentially is lifetime maintenance cost projections broken down to an hourly rate per engine hour flown, and we're invoiced monthly for it. So our funding source is um, in the helicopter unit. It's uh, 101 6414 as noted in the slide. And what we're asking for is a five-year contract renewal, which is not to exceed $315,000 a year in total contract amount for over five years, which amounts to $1.575 million. And that's my presentation. Are there any questions I can answer? I do have a question, but I'll ask the uh, other directors if they have questions. Uh, Director Rosario. Yeah, thank you. And again, congratulations, uh, Giorgio, on your, uh, on your promotion. Thank you very Good much. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. Um, the, uh, the, uh, I see you've, you've capped the, um, uh, the, the fixed hourly rates. The, does that include parts or just, just labor? Uh, it's both parts and labor. It's whatever our in-house maintenance mechanic um, it, that's kind of out of his ex expertise to handle. Um, and then it helps us in the long run for when there are those big overhauls uh, based on the yeah. on the hourly intervals. Wow, that's pretty good. And then um, outside of this agreement, <laughs> just curious, uh, <clears throat> how many hours does each helicopter have to fly to, to, to be, uh, not to be certified to fly? Do we know that? Uh, great question, Director Rosario. I can definitely find that out for you. Okay, yeah. And then, uh, are we uh, are we fully staffed now with the uh, with pilots? We are getting there. I'm happy to report that we just had uh, one of our pilots get signed off to be a solo pilot, uh, and then we have another pilot who's going to be graduating shortly uh, from the academy. Uh, we're very happy to have her on board, so we should be having her hopefully down here uh, towards the end of June get her field training in, and then she'll be, uh, once she uh, completes that, she'll be down at the hangar and flying around. So there'll be some new faces for you all to meet. Good, I'll be, uh, be happy to uh, celebrate our first, uh, our first woman pilot. My team. Yeah, Absolutely. great. We're very happy about that. Yeah, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Congratulations, that's awesome. Thank you. Good. All right, Director Wieskamp, do you have any questions? Yes. How many hours a day would you say our helicopters are up? Um, is there an average or is it change, I assume, during fire season? That's another good question, Director Wieskamp. Uh, so it fluctuates. Um, obviously, our numbers are going to be a little higher this year comparatively to last year, and that was due to staffing. Uh, we mm -hmm. only had a um, our chief pilot down there, and he had uh, two tactical flight officers. Now that we have uh, a pilot who's completed training, then we're going to onboard another one. Our hours will increase. So I can't give you a, um, a number right, right off That's the top okay. of my head, but we'll definitely see improvements as far as uh, flight time uh, this summer as um, with everything being considered. It's a valuable asset. So if we have the staff, it ought to be up there. So that's good. Congratulations. Absolutely. I do see the chief smiling broadly that he's going to have it fully staffed. So congratulations, chief. Thank you very much. And looking at the notes and listening to your presentation, um, it looks like on the um, the hours, there's a scheduled number of hours. It's not necessarily the actual hours that are tracked, or we just have a certain number of hours that we aim to be flying. So uh, are you talking about when we get the service intervals or just hours in general that our uh, helicopters are up? Well, I'm looking at it uh, in recognition of the contract. Uh, okay. Where the, you know, it's based on the number of hours flown annually, scheduled number of hours flown annually. annually. And of course, um, there's the uh, uh, paying for the uh, service, service work as well for, for them. Sure. Sure. Uh, thank you, Director Corbett. Um, the way I related to is vehicle maintenance. Uh, you have your uh, major mileage that you need to take your vehicle and in, um, into the, you know, whether you take it to the dealer or take it to uh, another form of maintenance uh, to make sure that different things are getting addressed at different intervals. Um, and there's also dates that match up based on the hours, uh, the average hours or average miles, uh, for example, as you win a car um, that you need to take into account. And that's how they set the dates and the intervals for the service, for the service life. 
Do we ever have times when we're using less hours for whatever reason, uh, whether, um, you know, those sorts of things that might take someone out of the sky for a little while or something that might require additional use of our helicopters uh, to even go next door and help a neighbor? Um, is that, can you help me understand that? Absolutely. And I see uh, Captain Breed is on. I'm sure he's going to uh, be able to provide some additional information. But um, that's basically why we have the model that we do having two helicopters is to make sure that we ensure we always have a helicopter available to the district for uh, whatever public safety needs we need, whether it's to address uh, fires or to address, uh, you know, helping someone who's who's lost or injured out in the park or uh, provide support to um, our officers out in the field. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And did you have something else you wanted to add? Good afternoon, uh, Director Corbett. Uh, Lance Breed, Police Captain, Operations Division, uh, former Operations Division, now uh, Acting Captain Chavez is uh, taking over that helm. Uh, we typically shoot for 1,000 hours a year between our two helicopters, so that's usually uh, 500 hours uh, per ship, and we we do that on a rotating basis uh, to, uh, to ensure that we have uh, operability of at least one helicopter at all times for the district to ensure that if we do have some type of major incident or major fire, that we are operational. So uh, we do rotate those. And uh, just like uh, uh, Lieutenant Chavez alluded to, uh, those major um, milestone hours are tracked um, and we coordinate that with our, uh, our uh, maintenance supervisor. Okay, thank you. What would you say our top one or two or three priorities are for needing our helicopters up in the sky? Public safety, public safety, and public safety. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> whether, whether you uh, whether you break it down with uh, fires or, uh, like I said, covering our officers out in the street or assisting someone who may be lost or injured in our parks, it's public safety all across the board. Okay, very good. Great answer. <laughs> I started to say that is a perfect answer. <laughs> perfect answer. All right. Thank, thank you. you very much. And uh, thank you for the great work that you are doing and taking care of our, our people who use our parks and, of course, our wonderful facilities and uh, open spaces and forests and all those sorts of things. So, and trails. And I could go on that list for about 15 minutes, but I won't do that. <laughs> and also, uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, for uh, the work you do to make sure this all works as well. So thank you so much. All right, I see uh, I see a hand up. Uh, yes, Chair Corbett, we do have one public comment on this item, which is uh, Mr. Kelly Abreu, who I'm admitting now. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, Mr. Abreu. People who use our parks and of course our- Mr. Abreu? Um, I am here. Um, okay. You know, can, it's a 40 just, second just delay a, just a on, moment, your, please. Uh, on your YouTube. So uh, okay. is there anything that's happened in the last 40 seconds that you'd like to communicate to me? No, no not we were at this time. Thank you. We were just saying, no, thank you. Kelly's coming on the line. Oh, so are you going to accept the public comment on helicopters? Of course. You have three oh, minutes wonderful. and your time will start now. Yeah, um, so it, it, I'm not sure what the what the annual budget for these helicopters was, but I saw like a number of $3 million on one of the slides. Uh, is that right? Uh, uh, maybe it's the right number, maybe not. You divide that by 1,000, that's what, $3,000 an hour for uh, running helicopters. Um, and what is that? Uh, $5? No, $50 a minute. So, um, yeah, it's a lot of money. Um, and the, the use of the helicopters, you know, when we talk about public safety, you know, over here at Mission Peak, you know, I've personal, personally seen the helicopters in the sky, you know, walking up Mission Boulevard northbound, I watched that helicopter, you know, flying at an altitude of like 27 feet, or maybe it was 250 feet, whatever, you know, kind of cruising along the foothills as I was walking along and I'm think, talking to somebody or other about the helicopter. At that time, the helicopter, you, you were renting out helicopters when you uh, gave it to other agencies at what's, what, 11 or $1,200 an hour. So it might be that when the money that you charge when you're called into other agencies, one of the things your accountant should be asking is, are you charging enough money to the other agencies? Because if you're only charging 11 or $1,200, which is what you put in your budgeting reports, you know, I remember those numbers. Uh, and and you're, it's costing you three thousand dollars to operate a helicopter. Then you're giving away your services and not getting the 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 uh, 
the revenue that you need to cover your expenses. And, you know, when we talk about the usage of the helicopter, like over at Mission Peak, you know, when when you when that helicopter is like sitting over, you know, the parking lot for I mean, literally just sitting there, um, you know, just stand just just right hovering at, at an altitude of 500 feet over the parking lot for no reason. Uh, you know, and, and I'm looking up, I see a helicopter over my head. I'm like wondering, well, gee, what kind of public safety is this? Uh, I'm very safe down here, I, you know, but, you know, the, the helicopter is just sitting there. I was, it, it, and it's expensive. It, what was it? It was $50 a minute, right? <laughs> and, and anyway, um, so, yeah, it's a mystery to me how the helicopters are being prioritized because was, I'd be hoping that there maybe there's better things to be doing with the helicopters. And but main thing besides, you know, why, what are the helicopters doing hovering in the air for no apparent reason? What are we doing to get the, the budgeted accounting cost when you loan out your helicopters to other agencies for $1,100 an hour? How can we get that thing up to like at least cover your expenses? Get it up to, what is it, $3,000 an hour, whatever it is that's costing you, that, that really costs you. I think you need to you know, do a, an accounting review and so that you, you charge other agencies your actual operating cost. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that uh, the time has ended and stopped? Yes, it has. And we have no more public comments on this item. Yes. And I just wanted to mention, if you read um, the document that was written for today's meeting, you will see that the uh, yearly amount uh, proposed is $315,000 per year. And then the five-year agreement um, of course is five times that, but that's much less than 3 million. So people should read the public information um, to have a more uh, direct number uh, that's actually proposed. So let's make that comment. Anybody else wanna comment on that? Okay, very good. All right, any more comments, directors on these items? Any more questions? If not, a motion is in order. Both. Moved by Director Wieskamp. Uh, second. Seconded by Director Rosario. Please call the roll. Ms. Chair Corbett, Director Rosario. Aye. Director Wieskamp. Aye. Chair Corbett. Aye. So moved. Thank you for your hard work on this very important uh, policy. Thank you. Thank you. You're appreciated by the whole board. We appreciate that as well. Thank you for the support. All right. And our next item, item number four is reservations update, swim season registration system. Get started on that one. Hi everyone, let me share my screen. Okay, can everyone see that? No. <laughs> no. Not yet. Oh, hold on. You think I'd be good at this by now, right? <laughs> Something always happens. <laughs> <laughs> this is my first rodeo here. There you All go. Right. There we are. Okay, now we just need the bigger picture. Hello. For that. How's that? Thank you. Perfect. perfect. Okay, perfect. Hello, I'm Shannon Punt, Reservation Supervisor, and I'm here today to give an update on the SWIM Entry Registration System, which we first implemented last year. So today we'll cover what is SWIM Entry Registration, the benefits, challenges, SWIM facility capacities, SWIM registration numbers, and what did we learn last year and where do we go from here? Uh, so as we all know, 2020 brought changes we never could have predicted. Everything shut down and we may not wait for quite some time. We never opened any of the swim facilities in 2020 with lifeguard staffing. In the spring of 2021, we did get word that we were going to have the option to open facilities, but with COVID capacity and social distancing and other restrictions in place. How to do that in facilities that were traditionally first come first serve was a challenge but this led to the creation of the SWIM registration system. In 2021, 
swim facilities did open Memorial Day weekend and continued through the summer months until about Labor Day weekend. The swim registration system allowed for advanced registration for entry into a swim facility. So a select day, location, and the time, it's always 11 to 6. It's a full day swim, but somebody to register in advance to enter the facility. It does require a customer account in the software system that we use, and registration could be done over the phone or through the online system where they create their account. When the swim facility is first reopened, Memorial Day weekend of 2021, registration was required for entry every day of the week. So from Memorial Day to June 18th, anyone that wanted to enter the swim facilities had to register in advance. And this registration was to limit the capacities in accordance with any of the local, state, and federal um, restrictions in place. It allowed us to contact tracing or to do contact tracing if needed. And it also helped to reduce the point of contact between staff and customers. And at that time, there was very little cash handling happening. So this helped to eliminate that um, contact between the customers and the staff. On June 19th, the restrictions lessened, capacities increased, and registration actually became optional. There were and continue to be benefits to having a swim registration system in place. One of the biggest customer benefits is that it guarantees entry. For any of you that have been to some of our swim facilities, especially on holiday weekends, they get very, very busy and can often reach capacity. So by registering in advance, someone can ensure that they and their families can enter the facility that day. As a mom of two young kids, I really appreciated that because I was able to run around on the weekends with my children and then show up at a swim facility and be, and be able to swim without any issues. The swim registration also helped with crowd control. We had a set number that we knew had registered in advance and we knew how many we could let in on site. It also reduced tensions because there wasn't this rush to get in and out of the facility. Uh, swim registration also improved communication. Uh, we were able to communicate with those that had registered if there were any changing changes to the COVID protocols or if there were any operational issues at the parks. The registration also allowed staff to adjust on state sales as needed. Um, if there was a staffing shortage or an operational issue at the pool that prevented the pool from being open that day, for example, we could uh, communicate with the staff and then staff could adjust sites on site sales as needed. There were challenges with this from registration processes as, as well. Uh, the one that we had last year did require individual accounts. Everyone from adults to infants had to have an account created in the system, and this was time consuming and confusing for people. The multiple entry free fees, uh, depending on age, also added to the complication. Uh, at the time, this was the only option that we had, so we had to do individual accounts in order to register someone for the correct fee. Uh, these two things combined led to a high call volume in the call center. And it also led to a lengthy roster in the park, sometimes 50 plus pages of alphabetically sorted names that staff had to go through uh, to let people in. Um, and there was occasions where staff, additional gate staff was needed. Uh, if we look at the swim facility capacity, you can see the COVID capacity Memorial Day to June 18th, 2021, the limits were very low, 300 at the largest facilities, 50 at Diablo Foothills and 40 at Roberts. Those were the ones that did require registration every day of the week. Starting June 19th, the facilities went up to 1,000 capacities for the larger, and then uh, Babel Foothills also and Roberts also went up to their full attendance. Um, starting June 19th, we implemented the 50-50 model. Registration was no longer required. It was optional, but we set aside 50% of the full capacity for registration, and the other 50% was set aside for first-come, first-serve drop-in. This next chart shows the total number of swim registration spaces, spaces available. And so if we look at, to kind of explain this chart, if you look at Contraloma, for example, we had 19,000 total spaces available for registration that summer from uh, Memorial Day 
through when they closed. Of the spaces available to register in advance, 10,791 registrations were made, which is about 57% of those registration spaces were taken. Overall, all of the facilities at least had 50% of their registration spaces reserved. And at the small facilities like Diablo, Foothills, and Roberts, we saw 99 to 100% registration. So every space that was available to register for in advance was taken. The 63% grand total of spaces available, um, or 63% of registrations were made out of all the spaces available. Uh, so it's a pretty impressive number when you think about 36,536 separate transactions had to happen to make that, um, that number for the season. It ended up being a very popular system. Uh, so what did we learn? That demand is huge. The 50-50 model was a success. People really enjoy having the option and flexibility of registering in advance and showing up without the stress of knowing if they'll get in or not. Uh, but the individual registration portion was frustrating and really time consuming. As we move forward, uh, we are making some changes to the swim registration system. We are gonna keep it at least for another season. And we're gonna implement it at two of our busiest facilities, Cole Canyon and Don Castro. It'll be optional and it's optional on weekends and holidays only. So we have no need for a weekday registration uh, since they don't generally reach capacity on those days. But weekends and holidays will implement the similar system as last year, except with one major change that it'll be a quantity-based system. So instead of having to have an account for every single person, um, I would have my own account and then I could reg register my two children by simply selecting the age category on the screen and paying and checking out and then we're all set. So it simplifies that process a lot, um, which will help ease the call volume and the frustration that we heard from the customers and the staff last year. Uh, we did get positive feedback from both the public and the staff regarding this process. Um, we've been in constant communication with operations and aquatics about what's working and what's not. Um, public affairs has helped with messaging. And then of course the reservations team has taken the brunt of the uh, calls and questions on the phones. Um, so it really has taken a lot of teamwork to get where we are today. We're gonna continue to evaluate the process, but we have high hopes that this is something that we can continue to modify to fit our needs um, and also continue, it'll still be a benefit to the public to have this process in place. Any questions? Thank you very much. Any questions, Director? Director Wieskamp? More comment. I think it's great, Shannon, that you could see both sides, your two children, how it worked for you, the other side were staff, I can see frustrations everywhere. So I think that's great. Um, helps you understand the perspective of the customers. So certainly very tough year. Congratulations. And I hope it goes more smoothly this year. We do too. It was definitely a challenge and the swim registration um, process last year, we had very little time to throw it together. So it was really you know, we just put what we could together and hope that it worked and we made the best of it and staff did as well. You survived it. We survived Good. it, yes. Good we job. Did. Good but job. But we'll continue to evaluate and make changes and hopefully it's something that we can um, continue to improve on. Great. Thank you. And certainly we didn't hear any challenges of COVID issues at any of these spots either, oh. thanks to the fact that you decreased the, the use, uh, which didn't make everybody happy, but it was a safety issue. Yeah. So, so thank you for doing that, extremely important. Right, I mean, one of the benefits with the swim registration also was that um, people didn't feel like they had to be there at 11 a.m. when the swim facility opened. So the, the usage was really spread out more across the day than right in the very beginning of the morning. So that's, you know, we eliminated the crowds and the gathering. And then the use was just spread out. So it definitely helped with the social distancing and keeping um, any COVID issues at bay. So thank you. Your hard work made a huge difference. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Director Zario. Yeah, great, great presentation. Uh, I'm really happy to see the, uh, the lessons learned and how you, you approach them. Um, I'm I was really um, happy that you went to the 50-50 because there a, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of families that don't have access to internet and it's really hard to fill out forms on 
at least for me, on on a phone, you know, which a lot of people do have. But um, so that that was I was very happy to see that. And then um, question of regarding: Do we charge different fees for adults versus children? We do, and so hopefully that's something we can discuss again in the near future. Um, but we do charge different fees for adults, children, seniors, and infants. Huh. Seems to me we should just go to one fee. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would have to agree with you, but. <laughs> so, Director Rosario, the, the general manager, she has asked us to do a review of, of district fees. So that's going to occur uh, during the next year or so. Yeah, that would simplify it a, lot, a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, and then do we have, I know reservations is, is, an, is, is an opportunity to collect data on demographics. Is that part of the, uh, the process? I know it has to be voluntary, but is, is that part of uh, the registration? It is. Um, so it's, uh, that's a rarely new um, aspect to our registration. Um, I believe in September of 21, we implemented demographic uh, questions into the account creation. So it is there now. Um, so eventually we'll be able to run reports and gather that information, but it is optional. Yeah. Uh, and entirely up to the customer to provide. Yeah. So are you finding that most people are um, uh, are willingly uh, filling that out? Yeah, I'd say probably half and half. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those that are creating new accounts, it's one of those questions that, I mean, I see it quite a bit when I fill out forms, so it doesn't really um, surprise me to see it. Uh, so I might say half and half. Okay, great. And then uh, the other uh, data question is, uh, have you seen anything in the literature about uh, uh, COVID spread in a swimming environment, for pools versus lakes? I, I haven't seen anything myself. I haven't. I mean, Pete De Quincey may, I don't see, he's not on this call, but he may be um, more knowledgeable in that area. I know that as we went into 21, there was a lot that went into opening <coughs> facilities, um, which is why we were so restricted um, initially. But he would probably be the person to answer that one, unless Jim knows. Has knowledge I do that. not. Pete would definitely be the point of contact. Pete, Pete has a network, you know, statewide in terms yeah. of his training that he does with lifeguards. So he probably has a better handle on that. We can ask him to reach out to you, Director Rosario. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, that's a question I'm going to be asking uh, at the um, uh, the California Regional Parks District uh, Conference because there's a lot of folks down south that have swimming facilities. And be curious to find out. I haven't heard anything, so it must not be a must not be a thing so which would be great yeah i'm, I'm sure uh, i'm sure if that was a a, a challenge for uh, these facilities we'd all hear about it and i'm sure pete would know about it for sure yeah i mean last year we were I, I don't know if i mentioned this we were one of the few facilities to actually open recreational swimming so you know we definitely had the demand um people wanted to get out there and we have so many options for swimming uh, but we were one of the few in the area that opened for rec swimming a lot was just lap swimming and that again was still registration only at other facilities but uh, for Family Swim, uh, we were one of the few. And Cole Canyon already has opened this year. So um, this process is already in play. It started April 30th. So I'll update you and at the end of the summer how that went. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. We might have a few things we should continue to look at and that is um, facilities that have places where you change. <laughs> um, you know, how do we keep those safe too? Because people are a little closer to get there indoors. So that's something to take a look at too. And, um, you know, do appreciate the fact that you're looking at the, you know, charging of the fees, but hopefully we'll take a look at all the issues because I'm sure you'll be hearing from some folks that um, believe that um, some people should pay less like youth or something like that. So I'm sure, I'm sure we'll hear that. So thank you for taking a look at all that. And then my other question is, um, you know, I'm sure we're following the current uh, news and keeping an eye on whether uh, COVID's coming back uh, to bother us <laughs> even more. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you'll be taking a look at whatever, whatever that information is as things go along to be part of our determinations. Yes, Jim has his hand up too. Yeah, Director Corbett, um, just to, to expand on that, obviously we're, we are following uh, both, both counties' uh, health departments in terms of their direction regarding recreational access and uh, activities, and also the, the State Department of Public Health uh, direction. So 
At this moment, I have not heard anything uh, that is going to change, especially since we're in an outdoor environment. Our swim, our swim physics are in an outdoor environment, so that helps immensely. But right now, uh, that's where we look for direction is, is one, uh, state public health, and then two, our local county agencies who often, uh, based on our experience the last couple of years, they may have more restrictive um, uh, COVID requirements based on the local COVID uh, rate, hospitalization rate, et cetera. Right. So we'll be keeping track of that as well. Absolutely. Let's hope for the most positive. <laughs> yeah. <So. laughs> all right. Thank you for all that good work that you have been doing to make sure Thanks. people have a place to go outdoors and have some fun and, and be as safe as possible. Thank, thank you, you, Shannon. So yes. Thank you. Did you have anything else, Shannon, you wanted to add? No, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Nice to see you all virtually. <laughs> thank One you day very I'll see much. you again in person. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. And that item was uh, informational. So no motion on that one. So the next item is park operations update with the lakes unit. Here we have unit manager Dave Vance. There he is. Hello, Dave. Yeah, I'll be on. See if I can share here. You see so the picture you have behind you, though. Oh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, share. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, there Perfect. it is. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, directors, AGM O'Connor and staff. My name is David Vance, and I'm the Lakes Unit Manager. And today I'll be presenting about the Lakes Unit. If I can get my cursor over here. Okay, an overview. Um, today I'll be talking about Alameda Creek Trails or Alameda County Trails, the Active Transportation Program, uh, the Stroll and Roll, Coyote Hills, the Monarch Butterfly Habitat Restoration Project, Dumbarton Quarry Campground, Wood Bending and Storage, Del Val, the CXT at the Arroyo Staging and the West Side Restroom Replacement, Lake Chabot, um, the EBRPD, the Staff Coffee Social, Quarry Lakes, the Rare Fruit Grove, and Shadow Cliffs, the Interpretive Pavilion, and the Irrigation Pumping System. Thank so you. for Al very nice this year, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so the Active Transportation Program, uh, Civicor applied and was approved for the grant to improve transportation corridors in a project that took over one month to complete. ACT staff worked with Civic Corps to brush and limb more than two miles of the ACT and Iron Horse trails, sections of quarry lakes and staging areas. Um, the Nile Stroll and Roll event returned May 1st after missing the previous one due to COVID-19 pandemic. This biannual event draws over 10,000 participants who may bike or walk the canyon as it is close to vehicle traffic from Sonol to Fremont. This event created to help promote a trail system through Niles Canyon and spectators can learn about the rich history of the area while getting outside to enjoy the beautiful canyon. Our trails department had an information booth set up on the Niles end of where they talked to the public about future trail development projects and natural staff provided history of Alameda Creek and answered questions as well. They also had a display of um, different animals to where the kids could come out and uh, feel the furs and um, learn about animals as well. Uh, for Coyote Hills, the Monarch Habitat Restoration Project East Bay Regional Park District partnered with the Alameda County Resource Conservation District to create a monarch, monarch overwintering site at Coyote Hills. The Western, Western Monarch overwintering population is documented to have decreased 99% from 1.2 million in 1987 <coughs> to less than 2000 in 2020. The Coyote Hills staff worked with the California Conservation Corps to plant 610 pollinator plants. Along with insula installation 
of a new irrigation system and inclusion cages to deter deer and gophers. The diverse plant selection provides a variety of nectar sources year round with hopes to build up our monarch population. So Dumbarton Quarry Campground. Um, <clears throat> we are ramping up for the summer with the campground concessions. We have a new way to distribute firewood at the campground with the installation of a cellular based and solar powered firewood vending machine. The concession can provide firewood at any time to our campers as it is, it doesn't need to be staffed. There are also two sheds provided for extra firewood storage and equipment storage for our concessionaire for future use. Um, I wanted to kind of touch on the occupancy of uh, from when we opened back in late August to now. Um, I wanted to show a chart of the usage and the occupancy as it pertains to um, what we've been seeing as trends. As you can see here on the graph, um, the occupancy at the campground in its usage, it started off hot and in the winter time, it kind of dipped down. But uh, as we see going into the spring and hopefully into the summer, that trend will start moving upwards as our occupancy will grow. Mm. Using my going ahead of myself here. <laughs> Lake Del Val, sorry about that. Um, what's new? Uh, we added a CXT to the Arroyo Stage area. The project will include ADA accessible parking pass and a picnic area. Future projects set to start in the fall will be the demolition of the West Side Visitor Center restrooms and replacing it with a 10 unisex restroom. The building will match the visitor center brick and mortar style build and improve the maintenance needs for the aging wooden infrastructure. Lake Chabot. On Thursday, April 7th, over 80 guests and 20 service award recipi recipients participated in the Lake Chabot 2021 Staff Coffee Social and Recognition Service Awards. This event was emceed by Director Waspy and Lake Chabot staff assisted with prepping the co-picnic site by setting up canopies and adding additional seating to accommodate social distancing. And one note that uh, was brought up in a previous board meeting that I heard about the eagles out at Lake Chabot, the tree that the eagles were nesting in had fallen, but I do know that the nest has uh, been rebuilt and it's active and we have two eaglets in there. So that's good news. Corey Lakes. Corey Lakes staff designed and constructed a Kiwi Arbor in March and April of 2021. The arbor is located in the peninsula in Horseshoe Lake, adjacent to the rare fruit grove, and is designed as a shade structure stretching over the trail and allowing park users to walk through it. Staff chose as a climbing vine, kiwis as a climbing vine for the arbor to complement the rare fruit grove and to build upon the general theme of the peninsula, which has over a hundred fruit trees and shrubs planted throughout. There are 12 different kiwi cultivators planted, including mm -hmm. a rare yellow kiwi, which, which were grafted specially for the project and donated by a friend of the park. At the start of the project, we used a civic corps to help assist with building the structure. Shadow Cliffs. In late 2021, the interpretive pavilion structure was completed along with an addition of an ADA drinking fountain, pathways, and parking. This project began in December 2019 and was put on hold in early 2020 due to COVID-19 pandemic, as well as wildfires. The project resumed in June 2021 with area grading and the ordering of materials. In October, the contractor was not able to complete due to unforeseeable circumstances. The project was delayed again. Through all the adversity and with the selection of a new contractor, the pavilion was built. The installation of the panels remains 
the last task to be finished for the completion of the project with hopefully no further delays. Um, irrigation pumping system for shadow due to uh, low water levels impacting boating and swimming. The low water levels at shadow cliffs have also impacted lawn irrigation pumps. The water utilities department led by Richard Guest designed and installed the relay pump system. The floating pump was installed in the lake to pump water into a 5,000 gallon tank on the shore. Once filled, the auxiliary pump, which is connected to the irrigation controller, feeds water to the sprinkler system. Staff can conserve water by managing watering times of the turf using the new system. We are also looking at potential upgrades to the system and locations of a new water source to complete this task. If I can get this. Any questions? Director Reese Camp, would you like to start? You know, it just seems like there's so many things going on. <laughs> Even I'm if glad we're here at operations and get a chance to see these things happening. Uh, I'm certainly excited about the pavilion that has had a rough time and getting going and stopping and going again. And so Hopefully we can have a grand opening this fall. Uh, I know uh, Pleasant Tonians are particularly looking forward to it since one couple of course came from Pleasanton and helped us build this and uh, they're looking forward to it. But I just think it's going to be great for school groups coming in and then for casual family groups, a chance to learn something before they go on a hike or maybe if there's enough water, get into the water. I'm not sure about that this year, but um, that's, that's a very exciting one for me. Uh, hello, Mr. O'Connor. Just uh, adding to Director Wieskamp's comments, you know, the, the pavilion, uh, yeah, it's been a rough project, but it's yeah. actually happening. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's really a model of things we're gonna do to the future. Uh, because uh, between COVID and uh, staffing challenges, you know, these outdoor pavilions allow us to provide uh, environmental education, interpretation of the park features and assets uh, without having to have a staff visitor center. So, uh, which is a trend that's happening even in national parks. Uh, you see it more and more in the national parks where they have a great deal of outdoor type of passive um, uh, recreate or interpretive facilities. So this is a, a trend that's happening nationally. And I think it's a, this is a great example of that. It's really, really well done, uh, this exhibit. I'm looking forward to having it, a grand opening, hopefully in this fall. Hey, team. Thank you, Jim. You know, since we're talking about that area, at Shadow Cliffs, the, um, seeing the, uh, the green tank, um, are we thinking about doing it at other facilities and would we be doing it to collect water when it might be raining? That's another issue we have to worry about. <laughs> In the rain, um, <laughs> but is that are we looking at that at, at various places? I mean, obviously we're looking at it near the lakes. <laughs> well, one thing the uh, the system at um, uh, at Shadowcliffs is, is not quite a, um, the same as the system you uh, you uh, might be referring to the one at Los Vaqueros, uh, part of the uh, Basco uh, Hills um, unit. So this, in this case, and this is a great project, I'll tell you, we've had some real challenges with irrigation at Shadow Close because the prior pumps were dependent on the lake level uh, being at a certain level. And after that, we were, we were out of water essentially for irrigation. So now with the new system, we can move the pumps uh, because they float on the platform. We can move them out as the lake level changes. They're not dependent on the distance of the uh, piping uh, from the shore. So this is a great project which is going to help us manage the uh, this park into the future. So it's not a it's not a collection system, but it does allow us to um, irrigate even during severe drought situations like we are in this year. Uh, and we will not have swimming at Shadow Cliffs uh, this summer because we've been unable to um, transfer water from uh, water from the arroyo this year because of the low uh, rainfall. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but going back to your uh, original question, question uh, Director Corbett, is that. Um, 
I think that the system out at uh, Vasco was unique in that we had that giant roof to collect quite a bit of water. Uh, going to the future, uh, as we move into climate change and we have longer and longer droughts, uh, the requirement for these types of systems may be more and more. Uh, the challenge with that is, of course, you know, you're dependent on rainfall uh, to fill those tanks. And if you're depending on that for your irrigation for um, uh, gardens or turf, that'd, that'd be really challenging. But I, I see this as it's kind of an economic proposition as we move forward into climate change and uh, we get less and less water. I think uh, the value of those types of systems and the need to deploy them more would be is going to become greater as we move forward. Okay, thank you. Director Wieskamp? Just following up on that, we're really lucky at Shadow Cliffs because we can get into using recycled water. You can't use it again in all parts of the park, but it's really helped with planting trees and so on throughout. And with that combined with solar facility there for parking, you've added a lot of nice shade. And when people can come, that's much appreciated uh, through the summer because of the heat. I think it's great that we use different techniques to get water. The creative one with those tanks just still amazes me. But my staff always amazes me what creativity they got. And uh, evidently the water was so bad they could not use it for any purpose. I mean, it is really vile water, the natural water. And now they have uh, some trees planted and they're doing well. And because of, he said one rainstorm this year fill those tanks up. So I think it's opportunistic and I think that shows what we all need to be aware of. What, however we can get it and use it, why not? Yeah, just to uh, point out that, that again, the, the system at Shadow Coast is, is a great example of the talent of our staff to adapt that system to our current conditions at Shadow Coast in, in terms of the drought. So it's another example of, of staff's creativity and talent. Thank you. But overall, as an issue, it would be great to be um, studying in all our parks, you know, how we can deal with uh, collecting uh, water and sure. does that make sense or not? And, you know, uh, can we put up systems that one rainstorm will carry enough water to water the facility through the summer? You know, so there's definitely some scientific research <laughs> we need to do. <laughs> some uh, guessing and proposing um, on what, what we can do. So, but it's, it's good to take a look at that. So um, thank you for the work you're doing on that too, David. Thank you. Um, uh, D, Director Rosario. Yeah, you. yeah I, I, I hardly endorse uh, water collection uh, whenever, whenever we can, but also we, we probably, uh, this draw continues, we probably have to really do a serious look at um, scaling back our, our, uh, our lawns uh, and irrigated areas. So, I'm sure that bridge is coming, but anyway, uh, questions. <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, so uh, congratulations uh, to David. Uh, good presentation. Uh, you're juggling a lot of balls in the air there. <laughs> so, but it's good to see our parks are always busy. Um, the the uh, the monarch uh, uh, restoration at Coyote Hills that, that looks huge. Do you know what's the size of that? I don't know the, the complete acreage. Um, it's, it was scaled back, actually. It, it was supposed to be a, a three-tiered system to where it's a bowl, the bowl, a mid-slope, and a, an upper slope to where um, it, it is a massive project. Um, but it, it, um, I could get back to you on the, the amount of acreage that it took. Yeah, it just looked... It just looked far larger than the, um, the restoration project we saw at uh, Point Pinole. Oh, it's way bigger than that, Director Rosario. Yeah. I, I, would guess it's almost, I would guess it's almost three quarters of an acre uh, yeah. from what I've seen of it. Yeah, that's, that would be my guess. And actually, like I said, they scaled down. It was supposed to be over almost a thousand plants that we scaled it down to 610. And um, I think that was the first one in district that we set up. And then from there, it's supposed to go over to, uh, I think, MLK and then Point Pinole as well. So um, they're district wide and hopefully um, we can recreate a good population of uh, monarchs through this project. So yeah, cool. Yeah, I like it. 
Yeah, the more we take credit for and increasing the monarchs throughout our whole regional area is just quite impressive and a good thing to do. So thank you for all, all your thoughts and work on that as well. And then I'm uh, just curious about the uh, vending machine at um, Dumbarton Quarry. So how is that, how's that stacked or stocked? Um, the concession, we, we don't have it fully operational yet, but we're working towards that, um, gearing up for summer. But um, it will be run by the concession to where they will stock it. Um, we're working on getting a concession, um, like a camp post, out at the park to where they will be responsible for checking on it and then stocking it as one of their duties. And will we be able to use some of our eucalyptus to, um, <laughs> to stock those? Um, that is yet to be known, but um, at, at this point in time, I, I do not believe that's part of the, the program, but we can uh, suggest or recommend, but we'll see how that goes. Almost free wood. <laughs> Except for transporting it, yes. <laughs> well, that wood's got to be transported anyway, right? So, yeah. We're hoping we can keep it closer to home up there if we can get into the biochar and the curtain burner yeah. project. And then, um, mm, 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 mm. happy to hear about the, the eaglets. And then I think, I think everybody else asked all my questions, but um, yeah, the, um, yeah, the, the floating um, the floating pump at um, that's that that's a good solution. Um, very, it harkens back to the old firefighting days when we used to have our floto pumps out there out in the lake. <laughs> very actually similar. Used, I actually used it one time for a fire at Lake Chabot. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I think I I uh, I was at Lake Temescal. I was watching them um, uh, hose off their. Um, their aluminum decks, you know, the mm. platforms out on the lake. And I says, why don't, instead of using portable water, why don't you just put a float pump in the lake and use lake water? So, yeah, why not? <laughs> so anyway. Works. Yeah. Well, well done. Um, we, I'm, I'm happy that I'd love to see the, the pavilion and waiting for the, uh, the ribbon cutting there. Should be cool. All right, thank you. I'm sorry I interrupted you earlier, Director Rosario. I thought, I thought you were done, but I'm good. You've all asked all the great questions, so we can go ahead and move on to the next item. And thank you so much, um, David, for wonderful work that you're doing and a great report. And uh, it would be great. Is there any way we can get a copy of that um, presentation sent to the board members? It would be wonderful to have that. Most we, definitely. We can do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much. All right. Thank you. Thanks for your great work, thank you. All right. All right. So our next item on the agenda is uh, number six, which will give us an opportunity to answer even some of the questions that were asked at this past presentation. <laughs> so uh, let's welcome Mr. Castile on the sustainability update district-wide water conservation projects. As you can tell, we all love water conservation. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good afternoon, committee members. Uh, Ski Castile, Chief of Park Operations. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. All right, can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. I see that water spraying. <laughs> Great. Oops. All righty. I can move this. Bear with me a second. Okay. All right, so uh, going back a little bit in time. So 2014 was the fourth consecutively dry year uh, and drought conditions continued into the winter of 2016. Uh, 2017, around the time that I started here with the park district uh, brought uh, you know flood conditions and very high temperatures, uh, which led um, into you know, significant rainfall and uh, water absorption within the uh, park district. 2018, uh, the, dry the dry conditions resumed. And uh, in January and February of 2022, uh, just a note on, on this one here, basically these were two of the driest months on record. The snowpack depth was significantly less and uh, melted early. This resulted in uh, reduced runoff and uh, reduced groundwater recharge for the region. 
Uh, also, voluntary water reductions were put in place by various uh, agencies across the board. This is the most recent map uh, for the Western drought map, um, dated on May 3rd. It shows that uh, basically California is in uh, severe to extreme. This is where we are right here. So we're in the orange here in the uh, Bay Area. Uh, so just kind of shows that across the whole state and other regions within the Western regions, uh, this is something that's gonna be, I think, long-term. And then taking a look into how we're doing across the, uh, the part of the United States, uh, the drought's persisting uh, you know, through about half of the United States right now, uh, being that that's most of the Western regions and then uh, remains, uh, but it is getting better and as you head towards the Midwest regions with higher rainfalls. Lessons learned. Uh, strategic <coughs> water reduction, you know, reducing water by design. This is something that uh, we are now implementing, similar to what uh, Director Rosario was just referring to, that each park is gonna be evaluating their irrigated areas and develop a strategic plan for water reduction. Um, they're gonna map and track the infrastructure. We're gonna be contracting with uh, Russ Mitchell and Associates, and they're gonna work with park staff to locate and map uh, the different areas. Uh, the other thing too that's gonna be different this time is we're gonna continue our water system operations. Um, in the past, the water system was turned off uh, to meet our goals. This resulted in uh, vegetation and tree die-off, uh, loss of irrigation, shut off valves and sprinklers, uh, which were very difficult to find later on as well. And uh, the diaphragms and the other operating components in the uh, irrigation systems were uh, worn out. And really, when it was time to really turn the water back on, uh, created major replacement uh, due to uh, lack of use. And uh, so this time we'll keep the systems active and functional, but reduced to meet the goals uh, for a water reduction. Uh, the other components, we're gonna train and educate staff on new techniques, equipment and material, collaborate with the water agencies, promote water consciousness amongst employees, which is gonna be critical to get the buy-in from them as well. And then uh, lastly is data collection to see how we're doing in relation, uh, set some milestones of where, we need, where we've been and where we need to go. So water efficiency techniques, as we just kind of went over, is gonna be uh, to improve our irrigation, incorporate the technology, uh, turf reduction projects that we will do in various areas throughout the park district. Uh, we're gonna go over equipment upgrades and turf species conversion. So one of the uh, things we're gonna be taking a look at is using uh, new uh, smart irrigation clocks. And the one that we have here is by Rainbird. Uh, basically it's gonna control the the programming uh, has the ability to go from uh, multiple clocks remotely using a computer or a smartphone. Uh, no longer have to actually go out into the field uh, to operate the clock. Uh, so, you know, right now where a lot of the agency or the, uh, the areas are, um, you have to physically go to the clock, program it. This will allow it remote control no matter where you're at. Uh, we're going to install flow meters. That's one of the other abilities of having a smart controller basically is that you'll know how much water is being applied to the areas and automatically shut down the system in the event of a line break uh, to reduce the amount of water loss in the event that that happens. And it also right. has the ability to uh, use a weather station if needed to, uh, capable for automatic adjustments in the field. So the map you're seeing here is an example of uh, one that Russ Mitchell and Associates uh, will provide. They're going to work with staff to develop satellite mapping of the current infrastructure, such as the, the, the irrigation lines that we see here. These would be sprinkler heads. Um, they also do for valving and where the boxes are. And they're going to plot it onto a uh, satellite map. This GS, GPS mapping will provide accuracy and show exact locations. That's really a big uh, difference from other... Um, technology that's being used out there where, you know, they kind of guesstimate where everything is. This is actually take you down to the nearest foot. So it's gonna be very mm -hmm. precise. They're also gonna provide an analysis to show the irrigation deficiencies and recommend improvements or system replacement where needed. It's gonna to help to uh, reduce our watering and the systematic approach um, so that we are reducing the water applications by percentage or by zone uh, in a uh, calculated manner. 
technology. We're going to uh, provide staff training on how to use uh, the TDR meter. We actually purchased about 40 of these and we distributed them to the different parks throughout the uh, park district. What this is, it, it measures uh, by what's called TDR or time domain refractometer, um, the soil moisture level, which is by volume in the content of uh, soil. This uh, unit will also provide uh, the turf soil temperature and also give you a basic indication of where your soil nutrient levels are. It also has the ability to use your cell phone to plot the different points and mm -hmm. it can put in for GPS so you can do georeferencing to uh, determine how much water and where you've been and where you wanna go with that. An indication basically, for instance, if you want to determine for the turf areas as again, Director Rosario mentioned, as you need to cut back, it's gonna be done systematically. In the healthy green turf area here for each individual park location, you may just for reference, have a number of 20 in the 20 percentile. Where it's still alive and a little bit stressed, you'll know what this looks like in the middle here. That'll take you to probably 17%. And then when it gets down to the threshold of where it has dieback, uh, that may be down to the 14 or 12% level. But the great thing about this is that you can incrementally dial back your irrigation using this technology to get where you wanna be at and meet the goals um, to deliver the exact amounts of water the vegetation needs to uh, thrive and survive uh, into the next season. And so by doing this systematically, you're not gonna lose a lot of material. You'll still be able to utilize your watering, keep it alive, and then when the drought ends or stops and the water allotments go up, you'll be able to kick your water system back on and still have your uh, viable plant material and trees. DelVal. Uh, DelVal has their own water treatment plant uh, for producing potable water for the park. And in order to keep the system functioning at an optimal, optimal performance uh, for public health requirements, the system must be used frequently by, um, you know, operating it to flush the water lines and to provide specific chlorination throughout the system. Uh, staff utilize the irrigation system uh, shown here in the picture to your left uh, to basically uh, assist with this requirement by drawing water to the furthest areas of the delivery system to ensure uh, peak performance. And one good benefit of this is that uh, we get to apply water to the turf and planted areas uh, as well to keep them viable and to use uh, as a public amenity. And pictured here on the right hand, this is Rick Parente, who's the uh, park supervisor there, uh, showing the TDR meter and basically getting uh, numbers uh, of the conditions of the soil moisture in different levels. <laughs> Turf reduction is another thing that we're taking a look at. This would be in uh, Tilden Park where we had a large meadow um, in this whole area here. And what the park supervisor did um, basically is cut a, you know, over did a lap of um, uh, mulch with uh, also sheet mulching and uh, planted redwood trees in there. So what this is gonna do, it's gonna lower your maintenance levels, your mowing, and also water use over time. And as the trees grow and develop, they'll be able to capture a lot of moisture from the air and put it back into the soil as well. And uh, take a lot of the CO2 out of the air. Moving into technology and equipment uh, for improvements. On your left-hand side here, top left, we have a verticutter. This is basically a unit that attaches to the back of a tractor and it cuts slices through uh, the warm season or cool season grasses and allows better air to um, uh, water ratio for oxygen and water penetration. Uh, they're by giving a lot more water retention over time uh, through the exchange. Taking a look to the right here, we have what's called a Greenlee Omniball. This is really gonna help out staff by uh, locating uh, valve boxes and um, so for your automatic irrigation valves and shutoff valves, basically you take one of these balls, you drop it into the unit, and it's almost like uh, using a metal detector. It's gonna take you within one foot of the location of where this ball is placed. So for future locating of buried devices, that's where this is really gonna help out. Bottom left here, this is a pipe locator to repair irrigation systems, track wires. It's gonna gain efficiencies and save water over time. Whenever wires break or the automatic systems don't function correctly, staff have to go out and manually turn the systems on and off, which is not only a 
uh, a loss in labor time, but also in uh, water management. The drill seeder, this is another thing that we're using right now. Uh, we have done several uh, turf renovation projects across the, the park district using this one. It essentially puts uh, seed in direct contact uh, with the soil to increase germination, reduce the uh, cost for renovations, and can also be used in meadows or wildflower applications uh, with minimal or no water use in those uh, particular applications. Hey, Steve? Yeah. Um, that technique also reduces the loss due to uh, birds, correct? Feeding on the seed? Oh, absolutely. So going back to that, so what the seeder does, it essentially, it, it cuts uh, just like similar to a verticutter here. It'll cut trenches into the soil and then basically the seed drops down and then basically, so it, it cuts it up here, the seed drops down and then it gets rolled over and buried. So there's very uh, virtually uh, zero waste with the, uh, the birds feeding on the seed and the seed basically gets buried into the soil profile. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, this is one of the other big equipment pieces that we uh, purchased in um, for uh, renovation, not only of turf areas, but this will also work into uh, zones where you want to decompact. Uh, this is called an aggravator. And so what it is, these are basically six inch solid tines. They're about half an inch in diameter. And what it does basically is the units, if you take a look at this here, vibrates. And so it's a solid time roller that vibrates into the ground and it fractures the soil 12 to 18 inches deep. What that allows, again, similar to what other equipment uh, can do, it, about, it allows greater permeation of water down into the root zone so that the air, oxygen, and uh, water retention is much better. The picture here, what you see is the end result. So unlike a rototiller or other decompacting devices, this one can actually be used and then um, on the back of this also, it also has the ability to have a cedar to where in these newly compacted holes to where they're opened up and then the uh, tines have been put in, the seed can drop in, roll it, and then you top dress over that and then you have a brand new uh, turf area. The top area here on the top left, this is actually Miller Knox. This is where we're doing our turf conversion. And we use the aggravator in this instance here uh, in combination with the slit seeder that you just saw. Um, so basically it encourages the use of drought tolerant species to reduce our water use. Uh, with that, you have uh, less fertilization needs, less mowing, and it takes the wear and tear uh, from high use by the public. You know, the turf repairs itself by underground root systems called rhizomes, and it spreads, uh, you know, uh, across unlike cooler season bunch grasses. So it's self-repairing. The other thing too, is it uh, provides a public amenity for equity and access. You know, where you've seen a lot more use of the public coming out to our areas where we've done these renovations, um, basically just so that they can uh, uh, enjoy it for picnicking, playing, or just relaxing for the day. Uh, so we're seeing more of these areas um, used as the neighborhoods are in turn reducing their water and turf areas. They're coming out to our parks more to enjoy, enjoy our recreational amenities. So this is the one that we did over at Miller Knox. It was using a brand, a variety called Kikuyu. And then at Brickyard Cove, which many of you just went to, uh, we've got the Tifway 2 hybrid Bermuda sod out there. And so this is um, a dwarf version of it. Uh, it is also a warm season grass of so two different types, but they serve almost the same purpose. All right, and so next steps, we're gonna to continue to collaborate with water providers, coordinate with public affairs on messaging. Um, that's gonna be key, getting that out there, making sure that you know, the public understands what we're doing, even though they see our irrigation going to understand that we are doing it in a responsible manner. Uh, conducting the park district uh, wide irrigation system evaluation and recommendations. Uh, that's gonna be done with uh, Russ Mitchell and Associates coming up. That's gonna also provide the AutoCAD mapping of our infrastructure. So when staff come and go, as uh, it happens in many of our facilities, then they say, oh, where is all this? That'll forever be captured. We're gonna upgrade where needed, train our staff in the water conservation methods um, and bring in the new technologies and make sure that they are on board with it. We're gonna reduce water in a systematic way, not just turning the system off. And then we're gonna promote water consciousness amongst our staff. Any questions? 
<laughs> Director Rosario, Director Wieskamp, do you have anything you'd like to ask? Uh, I'm so, so appreciating your work on water reduction so awesome. and keeping plants going while, while you're at it. And yeah, that, that was one of the biggest things that we saw in the last one. We lost a lot of trees, actually, in some of our critical areas, and we can't get those back. Um, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. we had to, we saw that at Contra Loma and at Shadow Cliffs and, you know, some of the other areas. And so we're going to do it in a more systematic approach this time, you know, with purpose. So we're not going to be losing all that material. And the fact that you're doing all that is such an opportunity to pass the word to others to preserve water at their homes, even. You know, if there's some way some of those utilities might be able to support you and give you some support, um, you know, whatever, <laughs> funding <laughs> to help uh, teach people how important it is to conserve water. That's right. maybe not, yeah, maybe they'll have some sort of grants available for us to do what we're doing to help teach others about it. Who knows? <laughs> anyway, Director Wieskamp? Are we working with other agencies on this idea of recycled water? Just you are. Opportunities. This was wonderful. It was a perfect location. But it strikes me we're going to have to be more and more concerned, as long as it's safe, uh, to do the right thing with recycled water. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Uh, it all depends on each municipality and where they have recycled water lines going. Right. Um, as you all know, the Shadow Cliffs, that is one of the, uh, that is basically one of the only areas that I know where we brought in recycled water. And that was because they had the recycled tertiary treated water going down uh, the boulevard adjacent to the property. Right. Um, so definitely where we can, uh, you know, bring in recycled water, absolutely. Um, I have a lot of experience in that, in that area. Uh, I managed a facility in San Francisco that had the first recycled water uh, usage in the, uh, in the city over there. And so just working with the different agencies and getting that on board as soon as they get the, the piping and the ability um, to get good quality water out there is the key. And I then making sure that we can think ahead. And that's what everybody needs to be doing when it comes to water and recycle water. I am sure they're working constantly to make it safer and better. But if all the agencies work together, it could be cost effective. And certainly I think it's going to be important. Good job all around. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. And uh, Director Wieskamp, I'm glad you asked a question about recycled water. Steve has a lot of experience in this. Unfortunately, um, regulations don't allow us to use it on a wider basis. Um, like it, we have it at Shadow Close, but we're using it primarily for the trees because we can't use it in the in right. the turf irrigation, which is a challenge because we can't be anywhere near the picnic tables. So maybe as we move uh, into the future and they improve that that process, maybe we can use it more broadly. And 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 we do. I think Steve. I think there's another project potentially in the future might involve um, Quarry Lakes um, near there. So there might be another opportunity there that we continue to talk about the water agency there. Yeah, I think they want to do groundwater recharge into Quarry Lakes. And so that might be a possibility where we can tap into that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But definitely, we're always on the lookout to, uh, to utilize those systems. Yeah. Director Rosario. Yeah, where was all that technology when I was a park supervisor? I think I spent <laughs> my, half my career looking for uh, water lines and leaks. <laughs> you had a creative period, D. Oh, yeah. It was. Oh. Uh, Believe me, I'm with you on that one, Dee. I've spent many hundreds of hours looking for stuff, and that's why I, I'm so glad to have this on board now. That's great. Um, yeah, around recycled water, um, I know Lake Merritt uses in their um, in the South Lawn uh, in their in their current uh, they rehab the whole the whole area around the lake. And I believe that the lawns there are all on recycled water. Of course, they're right next to the they're right next to the East Bay Mud Pipeline. Uh, and also, the, um, I know that East Bay Mud applying for a permit to extend, uh, to, to build a, um, uh, a, a recycling plant in Richmond. So there's gonna be opportunities there. And then I know Central San, uh, Sanitary in Contra Costa, they're the, um, they're the poster child for recycled water. They actually provide free water um, mm -hmm. to, to the residents of, of uh, um, their constituency there. Uh, if you need water, they'll drop off a, a hundred gallon tank in front of your house 
for your for your uh, for your plants and stuff. Oh, that's so, great. Uh, I think yeah, I think I director waste camps correct. I think there's going to be a huge um, huge demand for recycled water and. And, uh, and Jim O'Connor is right too. It's it's only going to get better. We're probably going to be recycling 100% of our water at some point. So, um, yeah, glad to see all this. And I think what we need to do as far we need to do some kind of a media blitz or uh, around our our uh, irrigated lawns because people are going to ask why can the park district do their lawns and I have to cut mine down. You know, so um, we should have some kind of educational piece. Uh, Around that, so that we're not be, we're not bombarded with with questions. Jim. Yeah, director, sorry, you're exactly right, and I was going to mention that in my closing comments in this item is that we we are going to have to. And the one thing that Steve said that's really important here is that you know we we service as the the backyard for neighborhoods right that don't have that ability. So we have to also make sure that. We're, we're meeting our reduction targets in terms of the you know, governor's directives we may get, get on that, but we also have this other mission where we're providing for this access for a larger portion of the community. So um, I'm really glad that Steve's incorporating these new technologies because it allows us to meet those goals without completely killing our turf. And we had some really hard lessons in the last cycle of drought because we turned these systems off. Uh, and it ended up being a huge amount of work to get them back once we were uh, irrigating again. So Steve's really brought in his expertise from both his educational background and his work experience in the municipal system. And so I think this has been really valuable to us. And so we do have to do a lot of good messaging on this as we move forward in the drought. Great. Thank you very much. I think we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. Um, as everybody has said, this has been quite a impressive uh, presentation. Oh my goodness, all the future opportunities for saving water. You've, you've got them all. <laughs> and uh, some of the equipment as well. Um, uh, <clears throat> a couple of things that I thought were, there's so many things I could say and ask you about this because it's quite exciting for me as a UC master gardener. <laughs> yes. a, plus, a plus for you, Mr. Castillo. <laughs> oh, thank you. And in fact, I don't know, this could be something we could talk about later, but, you know, I don't know if you'd ever want to ask the master gardeners to come in and, and give some little talks about water conservation at some of our facilities for the public to come in and listen to them about some of those opportunities. Maybe that will help them understand why we're doing what we're doing. <laughs> sure, so, we should definitely look into that. Yeah, yeah. If you're interested, uh, let, let me know. I, I know some people we could ask about that. Okay. Um, so many things that you're proposing, amazing. So I'll just touch on a few of them. Uh, one of them, the sprinkler systems with the timers and all that. So, so amazing that you can put that in. That so can save water. Um, I would just ask, I'm sure you've already thought of this, that there's some way that um, the various uh, timing equipment, it sounds like a lot of it might be uh, further away than just right on, uh, right on the land. But if there's a way to make sure that it's uh, covered or uh, protected, so people don't borrow some of our oh my goodness <laughs> equipment, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so I'm sure you've thought about that. A lack of faith there. Ways to keep them safe. Yes, so, it is. Yes, thank you very much. And then it was also impressive to see a picture with some mulch on it, knowing that we're going to have plenty of mulch uh, because of other work we're doing in the park district uh, with their forests and such and such. Um, and to teach people the importance of mulch and, and use our mulch for these very, very important uh, opportunities to, again, protect us from using too much water uh, if we don't have to. So that's really great. And let's see, what else? So impressive to see all the new um, and, and the level of technology that's out there and available for us to use um, to do the work we want to do. So um, very, 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 very impressive. Um, presentation on all it's look like we're looking at everything <laughs> and we have uh, we're putting together those programs so so thank you for that um, good job great thank you I like saving water <laughs> thank you all right um, any other comments on this item okay we've completed a lot of great presentations today thank you very much Jim for that one excuse me I mean, Mr. Castillo. 
<laughs> Sorry, Mr. Castile and Jim. Okay, our next item is um, public comments. So do we have any public comments for this evening? Chair Corbin, no, we do not have any more public comments at this time. Okay, very good. So we're on item number eight, committee comments. Any committee members have anything additional to say? Informative as always. Yeah, just very well done. Good presentations, uh, timely as well. Um, looking forward to, uh, much congratulations to staff for all the incredible projects that everyone's working on. And I mean, we've, we've said it a million times, but it, it's, it always comes to the fact that our, we have great staff and they're, everybody's incredibly um, resilient and got there. I, I wish I was a park ranger today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, it's so, it's so impressive to see that, uh, that we're doing everything we can to protect the environment and uh, protect uh, the use of, of water and, and the fact that we may have some challenges there, but we're doing everything we can to uh, put together the programs that will allow us what we need to uh, bring down that usage of water, but still have a fine looking park district and showing that off for everybody else. We, you know, we're the largest park district in the country. We can be the best environmental district for the country as well. And the best uh, water conserver too. Maybe can we can start winning some awards on some of this great stuff we're doing. <laughs> All right, Absolutely. thank you very much. Okay, so that's it for committee comments. Yes, and did you have anything else? I just think it's amazing what we learn at these meetings. You know, some Zooms you go to and you think, oh my, but there's always something good on the agenda here. Yes. So I appreciate that. And Dee, did you have something else? Did I see your hand? Yeah, up? I just wanted to, uh, I just uh, recently learned that um, uh, Karen McClendon's father pa passed away this this winter and I just wanted to uh, I ask that we close uh, in his memory. Okay. Um, Oh, yes. Would you like to um, uh, wait till after the general manager comments and do sure. it just for the adjournment? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm sorry to hear that too. Um, Mr. O'Connor, assistant general manager, what would you like to say? <laughs> um, I'm going to keep the meeting short. I have no comments uh, other than we're ramping up for swim season uh, and uh, we are... Uh, Modern situation at Contra Loma uh, and trying to see where we're going to be at with Contra Loma, but all the uh, trying to get all the swim areas open that we can. Uh, and I had a chance to look at the uh, Roberts project the other day when we were up there. I think it's moving along pretty well. Uh, so we'll be excited to have that one open next year. A nice brand new pool for the communities. So that's great. So those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chief. I see your picture now too. <laughs> All right. Um, all right. So, uh, uh, Dee, would you like to go ahead with, with that uh, honor? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to offer our, our condolences to, um, to Karen on the loss of her father. Uh, he was, he was a, a loving character. Uh, I think many of us knew him when uh, Karen, uh, or had the opportunity to meet him when Karen was living there at, um, at Crab, Crab Cove residence there for a while. Uh, a gentleman's gentleman and uh, well loved and uh, well well remembered. So, uh, our condolences to Karen. Thank you very much, and we adjourn this committee in honor. Thank you very much, and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much. Take care. <laughs> <laughs>